Hi, I'm Gigi, an ex-Amazon senior leader and bar raiser here at Day One Careers. So lots of you come to us and say, you're not just interested in how to pass the Amazon interview, but you are also interested in understanding what it's like to work at Amazon. So the best way that we know how to help you with that is for you to hear it straight from experienced Amazonians. Not that we're not experienced, but other experienced Amazonians. So we want you to hear it from the most experienced, successful and knowledgeable Amazonians that we can find. So we have partnered with Tyler Wallace, who is also an ex-Amazon bar raiser. He produces his own brilliant podcast, interviewing some of Amazon's most well-known and successful leaders. He'll introduce himself shortly, but before he does, I just need to warn you that unusually for YouTube, this is going to be an audio only piece as of course Tyler's work is in fact a podcast. But please honestly do stick with it. You'll get access to insights from some serious big hitters from Amazon and the conversations Tyler has with them are absolute gold. So over to Tyler. Hi, this is Tyler Wallace, the host of the Think Like Amazon podcast and a former seven year Amazonian. During my time at Amazon, I had amazing opportunities to build and lead teams in Amazon retail, marketing, and marketplace across the US and Canada and spanning various product categories. One of my capstone experiences was serving as an Amazon bar raiser, where I came to appreciate Amazon's unique leadership principles at a deeper level. I left Amazon to build the lab consult where I enjoy consulting and advising consumer brands to help them profitably accelerate their growth on Amazon. Through these engagements, I've found that many of Amazon's leadership principles, mental models, and operating mechanisms can be applied to improve other businesses. This led me to launch the Think Like Amazon podcast, where I sit down with former Amazon executives to tease out how to apply Amazon's unique principles and processes to grow and manage their own businesses. I'm pleased to partner up with Day One Careers to make these leadership conversations available to others looking to better understand the core principles behind Amazon's growth and culture. I hope you enjoy these conversations. I'm Tyler Wallace, a seven-year former Amazonian, current brand consultant, and your host as we learn to think like Amazon. Welcome to the Think Like Amazon podcast. Today, I'm pleased to welcome Justin Maynard to the show. Justin spent 10 years at Amazon, where he helped lead Baby Registry to become the number one US registry, reinvented the vendor negotiation process that led to a billion dollars in profitability improvements, and received a Just Do It award from Jeff Bezos for inventing a new communication system for vendors and sellers. Since leaving Amazon, Justin has gone on to found multiple tech startups and is currently the CEO of DataSpark, a startup bringing actionable insights to brands and sellers on Walmart Marketplace. I've personally enjoyed Justin's frequent writing about productivity and effective mechanisms, and I'm really excited to have him here with us. Justin, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Tyler. I'm glad to be here. To start off, tell us a little bit more about yourself and a bit more about your work at Amazon. So... I started back in 2008, I was an MBA intern on the detail page team. And at that time, there was really nobody looking at everything below the fold. There are all these features uh, down there, the customer reviews, customer discussions, product information, lots of stuff down there. But nobody had really ever taken a systematic look to, should it be the same for every category? Should it be different? Even though they were all different, there was not a lot of purpose. And so I took on this project to First, understand which features were even down there because tech teams could just launch new features uh, when they wanted. And, and then second, make some recommendations. So that had a lot of fun. I came back, decided to go a little more on the business side. And I managed the market. When I, this is when I came back full time in 2009, managed the marketplace business for tools and home improvement and had a lot of fun growing that. And then decided to go to the one P side, the first party side, leading pets. And pets was this small category within home. And we had this goal to turn it into its own standalone category with its own dedicated team. And so I had a lot of fun doing that and then moved on to the Canada business where it was going through a big expansion. At this time, Canada hadn't received a lot of investment for many years. And at this point, they decided we're going to go big on Canada. And so I was part of that transition. It was the fastest category expansion of any locale that we'd ever done. So that was a lot of fun. And then I moved into these 
what's called biz tech leader roles, uh, which was a lot of fun. I would lead a, a program where I had the business, the product, and the tech all reporting up to me. And as you mentioned, I started with baby registry. I did that for sampling. I led a team called Consumables Customer Experience, where we did all the features for grocery, beauty, health, and personal care, et cetera. And then I did a stint over on the devices side where I had a few teams. Uh, we had a couple of customer programs, uh, trade-in and installments, and uh, we're driving that. And then I had another team focusing on data engineering, and then another team that was building marketing tools for our internal marketers. And so we were help figuring out how to help launch products faster, how to get more eyeballs on those and building the tools to do that. So that was my time at Amazon. I think if, if I were to pick a theme out of what you just shared, Justin, from working with the ambiguity on the detail page in that first role to being on a lot of these very nascent teams at, at stages of high growth, a lot of building, it sounds like you're attracted to coming out of businesses at that stage where they're needing to grow fast, they're building a lot of new systems or playbooks to get to that stage two of growth. Yeah, you know, I think it's helpful sometimes for people uh, to break down the stage of a, both a company and a team. This team can be in the building phase, the scaling phase, or the optimization phase. And for me, I loved the building and scaling far more than the optimizing phase. Some people love the optimizing. You dig really deep, you find a small improvement, and it might drive millions of dollars for that optimization. And so sometimes it's good to know which of those really calls to you the most. Scaling is the one, as you highlighted, that I gravitated to the most, that's where most of my wins are. But I think I get equally energized by the scaling and the building phase. Super helpful to break it down in those three components. Since you spent a lot of time in the, the building and especially that scaling phase, how did you find Amazon's think big principle to play into your approach in helping to build and helping to scale those businesses? When I was looking at companies, I think the focus on customer obsession, think big, focus on innovation, they were the major, some of the major reasons I was attracted to Amazon. I love thinking differently and Amazon created a safe space where you could try it a different way. The ownership structure really played into this. When I started, I was managing the marketplace for tools and home improvement, as I mentioned. And it was interesting that my manager had never managed a marketplace before. None of my peers that I sat around, they were all, many of them were on the one piece side or in stock side. And they just, they'd never managed this and somewhat alone. And that was invigorating to me. I got to do whatever I wanted and it worked. During my time, I grew the growth rate from 25% growth when I started to 80% when I left. And I loved that type of ownership because it, it forced innovation. I had to think differently if I was going to succeed. And I could think differently and nobody was going to stop me because they didn't know any better. <laughs> I want to touch on something you just mentioned, Justin. You said that peers and managers, those around you didn't have a lot of experience and you had to figure it out, but you said that was invigorating to you. Do you think that being able to thrive in a white space environment is something that anybody can learn or do you think that it's certain personalities that can do it and find that invigorating and, and maybe others would just really struggle? So I do think anybody can learn to innovate. I think that specific aspect of how ownership was set up where you were given a lot of ambiguity and it was moving fast. I think some people really like that and some people don't. And I think that does come down to people's personality. And I think Amazon has been controversial over the years as to what type of company is it an amazing play, company to work for? Is it a horrible place to work for? And I've always thought it's amazing place for the right person. And I think many companies are like this, especially those that have a little bit more of an extreme culture. They don't try to be everything to everybody, to every employee. And I think as employees, it's often your responsibility before you join a company to make sure this is the one that's right for me. I want to talk a little bit more about this think big principle, clearly something that you embodied to hit a lot of these deliverables and milestones and achievements in your time at Amazon. And, and for those listening, the Think Big principle Amazon is defined as thinking small is a self-fulfilling prophecy. Leaders create and communicate a bold direction that inspires results. They think differently and look around corners for ways to serve customers. Justin, could you maybe tell us about a time when in one of these roles you had where you had a lot of this white space, you had to set a vision that you realized that you had followed this Think Big principle Sure. I think a good example is, as I mentioned, when I led the pets category, at the time there were just, I just had a small team of vendor managers 
And we wanted to grow this. It, we, we knew pets had a lot of potential. It's a big category, but we didn't know if Amazon could win in this space. And we needed to prove that Amazon could win. And we need to do that by really increasing the growth, doing something dramatic. And so shortly after I took over, I, I knew one of the key goals was adding new vendors, adding more selection. That's a key way of growing. And so I started asking my team how we could do this, started looking at the different options. And we had this trade show coming up. And I said, hey, this seems like a, a great opportunity to add a bunch of selection. There's going to be hundreds of vendors there. How many, what, what's our typical goal for signing up vendors? And I can't remember what the exact goal was, but it was 30, 40 uh, new vendors would be good, a nice success. And I said, what if I wanted to sign up every vendor at the show? What would that take? And my team looked at me and said, well, you can't do that. I said, okay, cool. Why not? And we started breaking down the process. And, and a lot of it was, you've got to have some kind of FaceTime uh, with them. They're, they're not going to sign up unless they know they're talking to a human. I said, okay, so what's the minimum amount of human time that we've got to give them? And how do we make that the best possible human time we can get? And then they said, well, how are you even going to contact all of them? And so they had all these questions. And we just went, started going through one by one and saying, okay, how can we do this? And we ultimately came up with a process where before the show, we knew that the best time was going to be that FaceTime at the show. So before the show, we would grab all the data for that vendor that we could. Are customers searching for their products on Amazon? Is there demand so that we could show that there? Are there any sales happening on their products? But to try to give them this lay of the land. And so then we'd create these scorecards and we'd go to the, the trade show. And when we walk up to the booth, it was almost like we could say, oh, it's inevitable you're going to sell with us because look, customers really want you to be on Amazon and you're not today. And that really turned heads very quickly. And so in a small five minute interaction, we had them hooked. And so we would leave the scorecard, we would come back and, uh, oh, and I, I did fail to mention beforehand, we were able to find where we could get all of their email addresses and we contacted them beforehand with any questions. I'm really excited to come by the booth. So they were expecting us as well. So contact them beforehand, had this scorecard when we showed up, we were ready, we we're prepared. And then afterwards we would follow up with them with, with these email addresses. And we had built some email tools that helped us facilitate all of this communication that you mentioned my Just Do It award that I, I got. And so all of that combined, that year alone, we signed up 452 vendors, and that was compared to 95 vendors in the prior year that, that we had. And it was because of how we'd maximize these trade shows. And really, you asked how I knew that we had done something differently is at one point, I found the data where I could see how many vendors all of the various category teams had signed up. I was able to break it down by vendor manager. And when I looked at new vendor signups per vendor manager, our team was off the charts. We did 5X what the other team did. And, and between this and other innovations, pets ended up becoming the number one fastest growing category for over four, the next four years because of all this selection. So that was a really fun innovation. That's awesome. Having a little bit of a biz dev background myself, I can appreciate empowering the top of the funnel and helping to grow the vendors that leads to that category growth. I'm curious, obviously, stark improvement there going from, I think you said, you know, 90 or less than 100 a year to, to several hundred a year through this new approach. When you went into this new playbook for uh, signing up vendors at trade shows, did you have that goal in mind? Like, did you say, hey, we're going to sign up 400 vendors this year? And this is how we're going to do it. We're going to take a different approach. Or did you start with the approach and then you ended up surprising yourself with the result? Yeah. One of the things I regularly do in meetings and is I find my mind consciously practicing this, trying to go to the extreme. What if we did nothing here? What if we dedicated the entire team to this? What if we tried to do this fully automated? What if we just scrapped everything we're doing and started from scratch, what would we do today? And so I, I find extremes really empowering and helping to think differently. And so when I started the pets category, and this is true of most of my, my roles, I'm always looking for what is that lever that if I were to just put everything against it would make a tremendous impact. And so very early on, it was clear it's selection. We did some analysis to see, are we saturated with selection or is there still a ton of opportunity? Very quickly, there's tons of opportunity. There's so much that we're missing. And so at that point, then my mind started just going with every possible way. Well, how do we add selection? Where does it come from? What are the different ways? And just started trying to break down, okay, we, we add selection from cold calls, um, from people contacting us, from trade shows. And I just started going down each one of those systematically and saying, which is the one that I could pour a ton of effort, put a ton of effort. And by the way, we, we ended up having to do all of them, but it's just that this trade show one, when I really pushed on the extreme of why can't we sign up everybody at a trade show, 
it was the one that had the, the least resistance. It's, I actually think there's some tools that we can. Now, people didn't see that, but I know how to do communication in mass. I think we can have an amazing human interaction experience with them and to start the relationship off. And then I think we can do the other things on the backside. There, there were other components. The timing was right for this. There had been some changes that my predecessor had put into place that enabled self-service on a lot of these aspects that would have been a bottleneck. And so the timing was just right that with those self-service tools in place, we could really put on the gas. Listening to you walk through that, it makes me think about looking at a machine and identifying the cog that if you grease, if you can 10x efficiency of that cog, will have the most dramatic effect to the throughput of the machine. It sounds like you certainly found that. You give some credit to the market dynamics, but I think that many other people would have probably stuck with the status quo and not seen the same results. I'm curious to get your thoughts, Justin. I love how you explain thinking about the extremes. And that sounds like a great way to challenge the thinking of a team, especially to challenge the status quo. When you think about examples where you've really thought big and, and delivered, and that's led to these results, is it something that you think that any manager or any leader Leader can come in and think about or propose the same ideas and get? Or are there certain organizational mechanisms or structures that you feel should be in place to empower this type of thinking and some of this risk taking? Absolutely. So I guess there's a couple of questions in there. First, I, I think any individual can become more innovative. Absolutely. And there's two books that I recommend in this space. The Innovator's DNA I really enjoy. It talks about these five skills. They interviewed a bunch of innovative leaders and teased out these five skills that help people become more innovative. And they can be learned. They, you can practice them. The second one is the innovator's solution. It really talks about innovation at the company level, the organization level, and the dynamics of why some innovations, even though they're great ideas, they fail when they are compared to the status quo or the the rigorous requirements that the more established business has for what success looks like very early on. And I felt like I saw this all the time. Beyond that, every manager, I absolutely think, can do this. And there's several ways of things such as one of my favorite things, I love options. I love asking people to generate options. Often you'll get into a meeting and what you'll find is you're at that meeting to make a decision or to kick off a new project because some executive said, oh, we've got to solve this customer problem. Go build this feature for me. Or somebody's mentioned, this is how it has to be done. Or a customer's requested something very specific. And it's very easy right very early on to just start putting yourself down a path and feeling like that's the path you have to go down. And what I found is when you just stop and say something like, okay, I see three ways that we could go about this. And it has to be three, it cannot be two. The three ways of going about this, we could do nothing, we could maintain the status quo here, we could do the option the executive said, or we could do this other option over here and push back and say that might be a better option. And when I find you say, I have three options, that suddenly opens up people's ideas. It, it gives them permission to say, oh, there's not just two options where it's his or mine or right or wrong, or that's often what it gets down to in this debate. There's multiple options and we're not about egos or who's right. We're just about options and what is right. And I think that's a really powerful tool. There's obviously well-known ones such as giving people a percentage of time to focus on innovation. I think there's trying to celebrate innovation ideas as well as celebrate failures and things that you can do there that really help and inspire people. So there's a number of things out there. I like the three options approach to empowering teams. Great advice there. I'm curious, Justin, as you compare these experiences you had at Amazon to other companies that you've encountered outside of Amazon, was there anything that you feel like Amazon did at scale that helped it achieve many of the innovations that Amazon is known for? Yeah. Think about different company cultures and how they innovate. There's three main ones that I see. There's probably more, but there's three that I've personally experienced. One is top-down innovation. When I was in business school, we did a tech trek and we visited a lot of different companies in the Bay Area and Apple was one of them. And one of the common questions we would ask is, where does innovation come from at your company? And the executive that we had presenting said, oh, it comes from Steve Jobs and the S team, but mostly Steve Jobs. And so according to him, the innovation at Apple is very tops down. We're going to have these big visions, and then we're going to trickle them down to the company, and that's how we're going to march forward and innovate, which I think has worked fantastically well for them, and I think there are many companies that they get by doing that. The other one is what I'll call is a one-bet innovation, and 
This one comes from when I started at Amazon, there was an executive who had come from the same prior company I come from. And we sat down and had lunch and we were talking about the differences between our prior company and Amazon. And one of the ways he described innovation at that prior company was really insightful and, and very true. Basically, once a year during our yearly plan, we would come up with a list of ideas, innovation ideas for the next year, things we could focus on. And maybe we'd come up with a list of 20 ideas. And then we'd do some research and analysis and we'd whittle that down to maybe three ideas. And then those three ideas would be taken to the S team. And the S team would then pick the, the best one that they felt like that they wanted to put the bet on. And then they would push that across the entire company. That was the one big bet that we were going to make for the year. It was on everybody's goals and everything was going to try to make that work. And so that's another way that a company can innovate. The, the third approach, which is more in line with what Amazon is like, is the innovation is everywhere approach. When I visited Amazon during my interviews, this is what was said as well. Where does innovation come from? Said it comes from everywhere. Jeff Bezos is innovating. The S team pushes innovations. Every level six a new MBA that comes in is pushing innovation. New, every new SDE that's hired, we're pushing them to innovate. And innovation comes from everywhere. And you have many examples of things that started at the bottom and work their way up and became something really big and impactful. And that's, again, these are just different cultures. And I think there's the right one that fits for you. I loved this though. And another way in that same executive, the way he described this innovation is everywhere. As he said, at Amazon, we might brainstorm and each team might come up with a list of a hundred ideas. And then we'll whittle that down to the 50 that we're going to focus on. And during the year, we'll come up with another 50 that we're going we're gonna to work on because they're exciting opportunities. We'll accomplish 80 for the year. And we'll beat ourselves up because there's 20 that we left on the table that we really wanted to accomplish <laughs> or more. How do you do the accounting there? So it also meant that life could be a little crazy and wild. And that, as we mentioned before, that's not for everyone. But these are three main ones that I think can work and, and can do a lot to, to drive innovation. In your opinion, is there one that typically wins over the others? Or does it really just depend on the company and the industry dynamics, et cetera? I bet on the innovation is everywhere. I think Google is another great example of where they just try to push innovation everywhere and push ownership down, push decision-making down as much as you can. I think in the long run, that works better. That said, there's definitely successful companies out there who have amazing visionary leaders and the S team, and they seem to be able to pick the right innovation that seems to work. The middle one seems to be a little more where it's a little bit of a bottoms up and then a tops down. It feels like a little more established companies uh, that don't move quite as fast. And this is their way to keep everybody going the same direction. But yeah, I don't know. That's a, that's a tough one. I, I guess it's a little bit of flavor, but I definitely would bet on the innovation is everywhere if I was looking at new companies. Just Justin, I want to shift gears a little bit. We've been talking about time at Amazon. You left Amazon in 2019. And since then, I know you've gone on and you've started a number of different tech and different startup ideas. And I know you're involved in a few today as well. As I think of it from talking to you, you've gone from this trillion dollar company, which is Amazon with all of its resources and structure to literally starting from the ground up and having to put those initial foundation stones in place. How have you been able to apply some of these same think big principles to the startup world now? And, and do you have maybe an example you could share with us? Yeah, absolutely. I left Amazon and I really didn't have a solid idea. I was lucky that I just had the luxury that I could take some time to meander and wander. And so I, I did. And I've tried a bunch of different ideas, as you've mentioned. I've invented several new things in the shopping space, motivation space, leadership consulting, done some data analytics. And I found it's just been really fun trying different things to see what's going to work and which I ultimately want to pursue. And I think when you have that luxury, it's a great form of innovation is a similar mindset to what I talked about with the, the pets idea, where you just start pushing on things and seeing which one gives when you push on it a little. My, my latest venture, as you mentioned with, with DataSpark, is the one I, I think is going to stick. We've gotten such great customer validation. It's a fantastic team that I'm working with. And this is where we're helping Walmart sellers and brands grow their business by providing the actionable insights they need to grow. Often, I think the best form of innovation is getting to know your customers really well. And you can't help but be inspired when you hear their pain points and it's going to give you new ideas and new opportunities that you've never seen. And so that's one of my key recommendations is if you want to be more innovative, just get to know your customers really well. One of my principles of innovation is think small. I know we talk about think big, but sometimes 
thinking small is really that first step of thinking big. And so whether it's getting to know a single customer, getting to know a, a single seller, or it could be an affiliate or whoever it may be, that can be quite inspiring. And so an example of how you can do this is you can say, what is the ideal experience here for someone like my sister who is our great representative customer? Or what would the perfect signup process look like for a new seller? Or what is everything that we need to happen to this product so it's easy to use even for my tech literate grandma uh, so that she can figure it out? And so and it's important, really important that you use the, the companies, the sellers, the people, associates, the partners, whoever it is that you really well. And focusing small will deliver really rich insights and enable you to then turn and, and think big. Yeah, I like the idea of thinking small and getting to know your customers. And it reminds me again of the think big principle, which says that the leaders look around corners for ways to serve customers. Have you found that by getting to know the customer, you can see around those corners and you can identify opportunities that maybe otherwise you wouldn't have, that would have held you back had you not talked to those customers and found bigger ways to innovate? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can share, we, well, thankfully, I have a, a CMO that on DataSpark who is just amazing at being tapped into the customer. And another Amazon example I can share here, we haven't played this one out yet, that was a great story, is when I was leading Baby Registry, right before I started, uh, Jeff Bezos in a review had called Baby Registry a mess. And I hadn't started in it. The leadership all emailed me and said, hey, just so you know, Baby Registry is a mess. I just accepted the offer to come and join. And I loved it. I was like, great. That's exactly what I want. I'm going to come and we're going to turn this thing around and it's going to be an amazing success story. But all right, the product manager we had at the time was really uh, tapped into customers. And one of the things that she did that I thought was brilliant is every so often, I, I, don't, I, I want to say weekly, but it probably wasn't quite that often. She would find somebody who was expecting and have them just come and would just do a customer walkthrough with them. And often should even bring a developer or two into these meetings. And there is something so powerful about seeing them walk through the experience and get stuck on certain things or little cracks. And we'd have developers that say, oh man, I released that feature and I just didn't realize that little way that I designed it or that I implemented it would be a problem. And they would go back to their desk and immediately fix it. We didn't have to cut a ticket or put it on the roadmap. Like they were just so energized by it. They'd just go and fix it. And at this time we had this, I, I do think good innovative companies, sometimes we think of innovation as it's always got to be something brand new, something that hasn't been done before. And it's really easy as a tech leader to always want to prioritize the new and novel. But I do think good, innovative companies will keep this intense focus on the customer. We had this one really awful experience when a customer would go to return a gift that somebody had given them. If it had come from a third-party seller, they couldn't return it directly to Amazon. They had to go and contact the gift giver and have them initiate the return. So it's, hey, I know you gave me this really cute outfit for my baby, but I don't like it. Can you return it? <laughs> so socially awkward. It was awful. And yet, because it was going to involve eight different teams to fix this, we could not get it on the roadmap for all these eight teams and kept getting deprioritized. And the truth is, customers don't care about the fact that there's eight different teams that have to do this, that there's all kinds of organizational gaps and and they just don't care. They just want it to work. And so sometimes innovation is coming up with creative ways of getting things above the line, even though they're not the coolest, the most novel, they just have to be done. And so in this case, we had to really pull out all the stops in order to get this thing above the line. And it was more of team dynamics and business process innovation than it was cool new feature novel thing innovation, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, to me, it sounds like identifying the right thing to do, not what's possible or what's easy to do, or maybe what's most straightforward to do. And I imagine based on what you shared that you really have to connect with the customer, get those anecdotes to understand what that right answer for the customer is, not just what's the most straightforward solution. Justin, as we get close to the end of the show here, what advice would you have for somebody that maybe is just starting off, maybe starting their own business, or maybe just stepping into a new role? Sure. I mentioned the two books that I really like, uh, and I would definitely recommend they, they read those, Innovator's DNA and Innovator's Solution. I also think innovation starts with being able to think differently. And I think being able to think differently often starts with really good questions. 
And there's a few types of questions that I regularly try to ask myself that really help me. There's a lot of overlap in these and we've touched on a couple of them, but let me just go through my list here. I think first is getting in the habit of asking yourself, go bigger questions. I had a VP who was so good at this. Every review we went to, he would ask us, how could we go bigger? What would it take to double the size of this business? What if we wanted to quadruple it? What if we had unlimited resources and we had to commit, but we had to commit to 10x the size of the business? I've actually often used this type of questioning in the in my interviews around Think Big. And I found that somebody who loves Think Big will be energized by these questions. And they'll come up with a whole list of ideas. The first question, usually the, the, the first thing that comes out is throw more heads at something. And that's fine. But you have to get past that. And you start getting into the new products and services that you could offer or the new customer segments that you could go after or maybe automation um, that you could drive. And so there's just a lot of ways of going about that. The second is in a similar vein that go faster questions. How could we accomplish this in half the time, 25% of the time, 10% of the time? What, what if we had to deliver this tomorrow? And of course, throw more resources will come up. But as you dig deeper, you're going to tease out things around automation and scale. In fact, going faster often means how do you remove humans from the process? It also helps tease out what is really important and what is not. And I think great innovation often comes down to, to knowing exactly what to focus on. Because obviously, we don't want just to think about innovation. You want to deliver innovations. And so focusing is, is key. And then uh, we mentioned the think smaller questions before. That's definitely on my list of how to do the ideal thing for a single person or entity that I'm working. How would it look to perfect or what would just knock their socks off if we were to build this feature like they would love it so often as leaders we think too much in the averages we think of the average customer this or the average customer that or we have 1.4 million customers that share these attributes and you'll find that if you're using that type of data to try to inspire your innovative thinking which data often does inspire but that type of data can only go so far in sparking innovation. It's when you get down to the rich details of an individual. They have to be a representative individual because, uh, you know, of course. But when you get to that rich detail of your grandma, your sister, your brother-in-law, this seller that you've worked with for a while, man, so many ideas come out. So that thinking smaller, thinking of a single customer works really well. Another one is just go to the extreme. I found myself often in meetings practicing this regularly, where what if we did nothing? What if we dedicated the entire team to this? What if we tried to launch this feature so that it would work for every team who has a similar use case? Would we still do this under the worst case scenario? What is the best case scenario? So just thinking through those streams, not because you believe that those extremes are the right direction, just because it's going to round out your thinking around this space so that the right path, the right decision, the right thing to do easily surfaces. And you will see possibilities that you hadn't seen before by doing that. So widen your thinking. And then we mentioned before, just the looking at every option. There's just power in helping pull out of your team what is every option on the table that we have here? Everything, nothing bad. I want to know every option. I, I will say there's a special case of this that's really important, which is when you're picking from the best of a set of bad options. This happens frequently with COVID. There were a whole bunch of decisions that had to be made where there was no good option. There was no option that was going to make everybody happy. And as a leader, if you don't lay out all the bad options for people to see, you will always be second guessed. Uh, at every turn. Why didn't we do this? Why didn't we do that? When you can say, yep, we evaluated 10 options. That was one of them. And we didn't choose it because of X, Y, and Z. And this is the best of all the bad options we had to choose from. People, oh, okay, cool. You're on it. And they leave you alone. It slows you down if you don't do this. I can find this to be very useful when I encounter a need to innovate or set a direction. <laughs> I'll probably reference back to our conversation here and think through, okay, have I tried A? Have I tried B? Have I tried, oh, I haven't done C yet. So this has been fantastic. As we wrap up here, where can listeners follow you or learn more about your work? Yeah, I'm most active on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. Probably LinkedIn is the best place. You can look me up, just Justin Maynard, and I should pop up there. Thanks again for your time. It was great having you on the show. Hey, thank you, Tyler. We hope you found that interesting. We are adding more of these conversations to our channel regularly. So why don't you just check out this one next?